Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, the host of the Ken Coleman Show, author of the number one best-selling book, From Paycheck to Purpose, is my co-host today. So we definitely can handle your career, job, and work questions, along with anything else you want to throw at us. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Thanks for being there. We're going to start this hour with William in St. Louis. Hi, William. How are you? Doing good, Dave. Hi, Ken. How are you? Doing good. What's up? How can we help? Yes, I just have a question. I'm 30 years old. I graduated with my degree in computer science. I currently work in a trade right now doing foundation repair. And I'm thinking of pursuing a career in the military, but not quite sure if it's what I should be doing. I don't. I feel as though I don't have much of an opportunity of growth using either of the skills that I've learned or would like to do them long term. Okay, so we have two different factors there. So first, I don't feel like I have opportunity for growth. Uh, with a computer science degree, I, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, technology is the number one industry where we stand today and going forward will continue to be so. So the sky's the limit on technology. Now, in the trades, I would say that's incorrect in the trades as well. But in your particular role as foundation repair, maybe that's true. So that's one narrative problem. The second thing you brought up is... Uh, I don't know if I want to do them long term. Now, that's 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 what we need to be paying attention to. So is the military just another option or is it something that you've always longed to do? You, you're a patriot. You want to serve our country in a specific way. Or is it just another option that maybe I'll kick the tires on because I don't want to do computer and technology work and I don't want to be in the trades? What is it? Um, I've always had the drive to do so since my senior year of high school and even through college. But now that I've been uh, a working professional for this long, I, I feel like I, I can't get the opportunity with my foot in the door to use my computer degree. And like I say, doing trades, it's, it's fun, but I don't, I'm don't. i not giving any benefits or any actually any benefits at all. Okay, but well, let's If pause. I offered you a job making 150000 in computer science, would you, be, would you have joy? I'm not sure complete joy, but I mean, it wouldn't hurt either. Well, I mean, what, why, why not complete joy? Honestly, it's, it, money's not a really a motivator for me. So back to the military thing. I thought I heard you say that you've always wanted to serve in the military since high school. Did I hear you correctly? That's correct. Okay, then. Why? What's behind that? I haven't had much goal or general direction in what I want to do, so I just kind of fall on you know, whatever seems easier. Okay, that's not a good answer, too. I've always wanted to be in the military. <laughs> it's completely opposite. So... Um, what you have to understand is, is that there, there are things that you do well, those are your talents, and then there's things that you really enjoy doing. And to this point in your life, I think you know what those are. So if I interviewed everybody that knows you, William, what would they say are the top two or three things you do well? And we're talking about a skill set. Could be a hard skill or a soft skill. What would they say? I'm not quite sure. I'm not, I don't have that many talents. All right, now we know what's going on. So here's where we're at, William. So I'm going to give you a couple of tools that will allow you to dive into this, not under the pressure of being live on the air. Okay? I'll tell you about those in a minute. But here's what's going on. Something has happened to you. Something has been said to you to where you don't believe that you have anything to offer. You don't think you have any talents. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So what we got to do is we got to get you to a place where you begin to see, wait a second, I have something that I can do well. It's come easy for me. People have complimented me on this. And if I'm, if I'm able to get through the pain and through the past and see that, then I can begin to realize, oh, I have something that I can do well. And when we get the clues to that, there will be things that we enjoy closely aligned, if not the same thing. So stay on the line. And I want to do a couple of things. I want to give you the Get Clear Career Assessment. And this is a wonderful little tool of self-awareness. I want you to take it. And then I want you to read the book from paycheck to purpose. <clears throat> then I want to schedule a call. Austin, let's schedule to have him call in on my show after he's done both of those things. And we'll work through 
what we now see. And Dave, uh, you know, our friend John Deloney deals with this a lot too. When someone feels as though they have no worth, they don't feel they're worthy. And then they have a hard time even identifying, I can do this well. This is a type of work that I can do and contribute to the world. And that's what's going on with him. Yeah. And then you fall backwards. That's correct. You just start things selecting things. Oh, by I'll try default. This. Right. Well, I mean, you just like take, take the path of least resistance. It's like, I can't screw that up. Right. I'll go to the military and they'll tell me what to do and I when can't to screw do that it. Up. Right. Now, and that's not that this is um, Earl Nightingale, great motivator, used to say that you take an 18 year old young man, young woman, and they've got the whole world in front of them. There's nothing but hope. Mm -hmm. There's nothing but dreams. There's nothing but vision. There's nothing but excitement. And if you're not careful, how do they select? their first career choice, what their friends are doing. Mm -hmm. That's right. I just got on down to factory. Come on <laughs> right. down there hiring. Right. And that's about how much work you they spend more time picking out a suit of clothes than they do a career. That's right. And you can fall backwards into mm. things if you don't uh, deem yourself uh, of great value. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're in the technology world and you actually know how to do technology, uh, the sky's the limit. Yeah, you're incredibly on what you can do. Yeah, but you got to actually believe it. And That's I can't right. get my foot in the door. Has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the technology world. Has to do with his foot. You nailed it. See, here's what's going on with this young man and a lot of people that are listening today and watching. If you don't see how you are uniquely put together, uh, then you will never believe that you have tremendous value. So this is really a self awareness situation. But I will tell you that undoubtedly, and I don't want to put him on the spot on the air undoubtedly he has been in an environment or he's had some experiences that has made him feel as though he doesn't have much to offer. And so awareness is huge to begin to see himself as somebody who can do things well, that's talent, who enjoys doing things, that's passion, and who is motivated by results. That's a sense of mission. And that's what's in the assessment that will give him. So I want the audience to know, I didn't want to put him on the spot. Uh, I've talked to so many people like that on the air that they're dealing with a cloud of uh, confusion. And, and when you're in that, you don't interview well. Yeah, you can't see because every, anyone doing an interview looks at that looks at that person that's using that type of lingo and sentence structure, mm -hmm. and they go, uh, uh, yeah, pretty quick. It's almost as big a turnoff as the other end of the spectrum, where you get a guy if you could buy him for what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth, you'd be rich, right? <laughs> but you get a guy on the other side who's all pumped up and you yes, know really thinks true. he's something he's not, right. right? Yeah. And that's the other end of the spectrum. And so when you're when you're an employer doing an interview or an, uh, an HR person doing a recruiter doing an interview, you're picking up on these vibes off of either one of these two characters we're talking about here. And uh, it makes a difference. Quiet confidence and courage is an amazingly powerful thing. It changes your voice tone. It changes your body language. It changes your um, the believability that you can add value to an organization. This is The Ramsey Show. It's a competitive home buying market, but there's a way you can get an edge. Churchill Mortgage works with you to understand your budget and your goals. And the Churchill Mortgage Home Buyer Edge offers you fast pre approval and a secured interest rate. Plus, Churchill has bumped up their seller guarantee to $10,000, giving your offer the best chance of being accepted and helping you win in today's market. Go to churchillmortgage.com today to learn more. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Melissa is with us in Rochester, New York. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Sure. What's up? Sure, sir. The reason why I'm calling in is because I'm having a couple of issues right now. I currently own the home that I live in. It is completely paid off. However, that home is actually my mom's home. 
Um, what was your mom's home? It's now yours. Yes, it was my mom's home. It is in my name now. It is paid off. However, it was originally my mom's home. She lost it. And so I helped her save the home. And now it's in my name out of fear that she'll lose it again. However, sir, um, my mom has made infrastructure changes to the property um, without this was before I even had the home. She had made infrastructure changes and she didn't properly permit the house. So she's gone now a couple of years with having rooms that she created into the house that weren't permitted. And so now I'm in fear that I may be facing any type of legal issues or ramifications that can come out of the house being in my name and her doing things to the home before they were even in my name. And so now I'm trying to just save myself any issues that may come out of all of this. And I want to just undeed myself and deed my mom back on the property and just give her the property to take care of. How old is your mom? My mom is 70 years old. Okay. What did she do to the house? She refinanced it. No, I'm talking about the structural issues. What did she change? She added um, bedrooms to the property. So she did an addition. Yes. It changed the square footage of the house. Are they not within code? Well, no, they had, if you didn't permit and you you changed the square, she changed the footprint, right? Yes. Oh, so the actual outside structure of the home is the same. It was never changed. But what she did was she built up additional walls, creating bedrooms. Inside. Inside the original inside, footprint. Inside the original footprint, correct? Yeah, that's why I'm Well, they asking. have no way of knowing what happened there. Right. Correct. So, no, you don't have any liability. Nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about? Right. Nothing to worry about. Unless, And that's why I asked the Did she question. rewire the house without getting an electrical permit? No. Did she replumb the house without getting a plumbing permit? Yes. Completely replumbed the whole house. Well, she added a, a bathroom. She yeah. added one bathroom. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is it done? Is the construction the done of reasonable quality? Yes, it is. Okay. I don't think you got a thing to worry about. Nothing at all. I think you got a thing to worry about. I, it would have been that? better to permit it, but lots of people do that kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's a fairly normal practice. Yeah. Some some municipalities are much more strict than others. I can't tell you that, you know, Rochester, New York is not like the toughest in the world or something. I don't know that. But in general, most people, you know, it's inside the footprint. She didn't change the dimensions of the house. And, um, you know, she didn't illegally do a trade other than adding a bath. I... I I, I really, truly, um, I, I I don't think you got a thing to worry about. And I wouldn't give her the okay. house back because she's going to borrow against it. Back. Well, and here's what's going to happen is she's going to screw it up. And then she's going to try and leave it to you when she dies. And you got the mess right. again. You, you're going to get it back. This thing's a boomerang. <laughs> yes. And now my, my one fear right now is, so the conditions of the house, the roof needs to be replaced. That's about $20,000. The driveway needs to be replaced. Fencing needs to be added because she hasn't. Is she living in it or are you? We're both living in it right now. What do you make a year? Uh, right now I'm not working. I decided to put myself back into school and I just graduated two months ago. How do you um, people eat? Safety. Um, Where's the money? Mom, well, I have savings that I use up right now. I only have about 2,000 savings left. And you have a paid-for house that's all run down? Come again, sir? It's, you have a paid-for house, but it's all run down? Yes, it's run down. Yeah. And what are you getting ready to do for any... a career now? I'm getting ready to go into public safety, law enforcement, to be specific. And you'll be making right what? Now. I'll be making approximately sixty thousand dollars a year. Okay, all right. Well, and I currently have. Okay, I would not deed it back to her. I would either sell it to an investor as is, and you guys go about your merry way, or I would sit there with a plan to to uh, gradually do the uh, repairs that need to be done out of cash from your new job. Part of this is you want to get rid of the uh, of all the negative things that your mom represents by getting rid of this house. Yes, sir. Because right now she rents out. That's that's where some of the income is coming in. She did additional bedrooms. She rents out the bedrooms, and so that income she claims it all because that's technically her retirement since she doesn't work. I'm sorry. The house is yours. 
How does yeah. she rent out your house and she collects the rent? Y'all are weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only because it's only because the house was originally mine. I did save it from her. I didn't technically have any financial investment in it. Um, How did you save, save it then? It. Um, I was able to, um, when she short sold the house, I was able to purchase it for about $40,000. That's she called a financial send, investment. Send. Yes, and she has since then refunded me that money. Okay. Um, you don't have boundaries. Is, you, know, is the I, line. I, you know, I, 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 th- I think you might be right, Melissa. I actually, I'm change. I'm going to change my mind right here in the middle of this call. Wow. I think you deed it to her and let her have it, and you go have a life. And when she passes away, you auction it off. Don't you ever move in it? Okay. I think this house and all the chaos that occurs around your mother in this house uh, is all a huge negative spot for you, and a clean, fresh start in criminal justice system is a a great thing for you clean no chaos simple little one bedroom apartment and you build up some cash again and uh you've come out even she gave you the money back that you used to save the short sale but you can just push all of this chaotic weirdness over to the side and not have to worry about it anymore and just, I would, yeah, I, I would talk to a title company and I'd deed it out of your name into hers and you go move. But only if there's a clean break there. Yeah. You have to, you have to you stay away. your own place. You, know, you have to have your life completely separate, yes. completely clean. All the chaos stays over there on her yes. side of the fence. Don't help with the roof. But anything around this mom figure is chaotic. I can smell it in the air. She's a character. <laughs> Mom's a character. And then you're sitting there trying to be a normal person in the middle of this character, and that's why I called y'all weird. So um, I couldn't figure out how you own the house, and she's collecting the rent. Uh, But now I'm starting to understand. So, yeah, I think it is a good idea. Let's just get away from it. But not because of the remodeling, uh, because of the chaos around your mom. And this is never going to be – it's always going to be the weird part of your life until you give it a little bit of distance and a little bit of a boundary. Mm -hmm. All right, Casey's in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi, Casey. What's up? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure, how can I help? Um, so I've just been listening to your show for about a month now, and I um, understand a little bit about the baby steps, and I actually just signed up for the financial peace uh, course through my church. So I'm wow, great. To get started on that, yeah. Um, so my situation is that I am 41, single. Um, I have 183000 in student loan debt. You're a doctor or a lawyer? Um, nurse practitioner. Oh, good. That's uh, even better. Okay. Yeah. So you're making um, what? 110? Um, I'm making 135. 135. Great. I love it. What other debts have you got? Um, I have 8,000 in private student loan debt. Okay. Um, 5,000 in a parent plus loan for mm-hmm. my daughter. Mm-hmm. And I have, this is the really hard part to even say out loud, is I have um, $19,000 in credit card debt Mm -hmm. from medical bills um, Mm -hmm. and other things. Okay. What we're going to do is just do what we do in Financial Peace University. You're going to live on beans and rice, rice and beans. You make a wonderful income. And as a nurse practitioner, you can also pick up some side gigs called ER on the weekends, and it pays really well. I want you working all the time. I want you spending no money. No restaurants, no eating out, no vacations, no life. And now we're making 150, 160. We're going to live on about 40, and we're going to throw 100 at this student loan debt. And you're going to be 100% debt free in around two years. But it's going to be two years of hell, so get ready. It'll be worth it, though, because you'll be free. That's exactly how you're going to attack this with great focused intensity. Good question. I'm proud of you. Get at it. Holler if you need some more help. Well, you've all played the telephone game. The first person whispers a message to the second person who whispers it to the third and so on around the table until the original message has completely changed. Multiply that confusion by 100 if you run a business with different software systems that don't talk to each other. That's why there's NetSuite by Oracle. In the early days of Ramsey, we were using different systems for all of our business units. We needed one single source for accurate data. 
NetSuite was the software we used to optimize and take us to the next level. NetSuite gave us the visibility into all of our numbers so that we could communicate across departments and plan ahead better. And as we grew, it scaled with us. NetSuite worked for Ramsey, and it will make a difference for your business too. Join the more than 34,000 customers who trust NetSuite to help make them smarter and make better decisions and level up their operations. To learn more, get a free product tour at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. I'm Dave Ramsey. Thanks for joining us. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Rebecca is in Denver. Hi, Rebecca. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? I'm wondering what your thoughts are on purchasing a custom tiny home. Okay. So my situation is I'm going through a divorce. Um, my daughter and I are living in an apartment mm. and we're selling our house and wondering um, on the other end of it, I should have between 100 and 125,000 um, from the equity. I'm going to beef up my emergency fund and then I could pay cash for a, cu- for a custom tiny house. And my daughter is a senior in high school. Um, Otherwise, I'll probably stay in the apartment for a few years trying to save some more money. Just kind of was wondering. I know how you feel about trailers. I wasn't sure if it was the same with the tiny houses. Yeah. What, what's your uh, income? Uh, 85000 a year. All right. And um, how long were you married? Seven years. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. It's a hard thing Thank to go you. through. Um, yeah. Well, here's the problem with the tiny house. Um other than the fact that it's tiny. <laughs> Here's the problem with the tiny house. Uh, th- there is no track record out there. It's a fairly new phenomenon, and there's no track mm-hmm. record out there that says that there's a secondary market for it, meaning when you get ready to sell it, there's no evidence in the marketplace yet that you're going to be able to sell it at all and okay. that you'll be able to sell it um, uh, for a price uh, even close to what you paid for it so you, okay. you could get really stuck um right. if they you know you know so why is it i don't like mobile homes well there's a long track record they go down in value a hundred percent of the time okay so we have a pattern an observable pattern and in finance things that's what you're looking for is an observable pattern and so it's why you would, uh, like, for instance, if you bought a home in a neighborhood uh, that is way out on the edge of town and is brand new, that's not as predictable an environment as buying a home in a tree-lined street that has been there for 20 years and is very predictable. You follow me? So yes. e- e- even those two neighborhoods, those are both single family homes I'm discussing there, but those two neighborhoods give you a predictable pattern. And th- that's why I would never buy a tiny home because it's such a new phenomenon. We don't know what's going to happen. And and we do okay. know this. We do know this. The market is, uh, uh, is nowhere near the per the number of people looking for a tiny home at a given moment would be way smaller than the number of people looking for a regular home agreed yes so your your opportunity to your your buyer pool that you would sell to is very small no pun intended okay. so <laughs> <laughs> not physically small but number small <laughs> but the gotcha. uh <laughs> there's a lot of tiny home jokes here but yeah the uh yeah so i i yeah no i would not buy one for that reason. It's okay. that simple. It's not that I hate on them or something like that. I do hate the, I, I, the this idea that they're presented out there as somehow the answer to high house prices, the answer right. to this or that. They're not the answer, uh, you know, not yet. 
Someday there may be a robust market of people buying other people's tiny homes. Uh, but today there's not. And so, no, I would tell you don't do that. I would rent an apartment for a little while. I don't think it's going to be five years. I, I, I think you can go buy a home. You have a good income. you got 100000 bucks to put down. So get you a good 15-year yeah. fix. You, you know, Denver's an expensive market. It's tough to buy there. But I would not give up on real estate for five years. So you, you kind of presented me three options. I'm going to be in an apartment. I'm going to buy a tiny home. Or I'm going to be in an apartment and wait five years. Two options. Uh, and, and I think you're in an apartment a lot less than five years. Um but part of this is you guys getting your your spirits mm. and your emotions reset after this pain that you two have been through, you and your daughter. And uh, just having a simple apartment situation is a, not a bad thing for a year. And just use that year to live very conservatively and add to the $100,000 down payment and then talk about maybe this time next year you're talking about buying a home. And, you know, it's presidential election year. Maybe we'll see interest rates come down. Who knows? Other than the fact that they almost always do during a presidential election because it's hard to get elected. You pretty much give up the White House if you give up the economy. Mm. So we kind of yes. got that coming, right? There is that. And, I, you know, I, I also think just with all the pain and trauma that they're going through, that high school senior daughter needs some space. And yeah. you're in a tiny home. There's no space, and her having her own, you know, place to move around that senior year, let you guys heal and get stable. I think this comes from a lot of people feel like uh, renting is throwing money away, and it's not when we're getting stable. It's not when it's patience yes. with a plan. Yes. Yeah. Spoken like a dad of teenagers. Okay. Yes. yes. Mary is in Washington, D.C. Hi, Mary. How are you? Doing okay. How are you guys doing? Better than we deserve. How can we help? Um, Colin and my husband and I have just started following your program, um, and you know we've made some some I think smart decisions over the years. But we've been doing things in the different in in the not necessarily the order that you guys have laid out. And so I wanted to call in and check to see um, sort of a a challenging question, a moral question: is should we pull back on things like tithing mm -hmm. or? retirement in the short term mm -hmm. to focus on debt. It feels odd mm -hmm. to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that it's a hunk of, of money. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We're just calling to get, get your thoughts and advice on that. Okay. Uh, we never tell people to pull back on their tithe. Okay. Your tithe is off the top. It's first fruits. It says in Proverbs many times. And so it's the first thing you do. So if you're a person of faith, which is what what yeah. you're indicating by saying tithe, because yeah. that's that's a, a a word associated with our faith. Um, so Judeo Christian ethic of some kind, of, you know, whether you're Christian or Jewish, either one. But that's where the word tithe comes from. So you're putting that up front. Now, the rest of it yeah. is um, the most powerful wealth building tool you have is your income. And when you give it to someone else in the form of debt payments, you slow down your ability to build wealth. So how old are you guys? Um, 40, 41. Okay. And how much debt do you have not counting your home? Uh, about 60000 On what? Um, 58 of it is um, student loans and then okay. 2000 left on a car. And um, what's your household income? Uh, about one hundred and ten. Okay. And how much do you have in retirement now? Um, we each have maybe between ooh, 80 and 100. Okay. Thousand. And do you have any money that's not in retirement? Uh, we have a little bit in savings. What's we a little bit? $5,000 in savings. $5,000. Okay. You don't have another mutual fund sitting around or another investment account or anything else? No, no. It's all sort of wrapped up in retirement. Gotcha. Okay. So what we would tell you to do. And we think this is the short, we know, we've proven this is the shortest path to wealth versus the one you're on, is uh, we would continue our charitable giving, continue tithing off the top before you do anything, be on a detailed okay. written budget on the Every Dollar app. The two of you are in agreement on what we're doing. I would temporarily stop the retirement savings, and I would clean up this debt in the next 12 to 18 months. And then you don't have any payments but a house payment. But this student loan's going to hang around so long you think it's a freaking pet. Yeah, it's, it's been around for, you know, 15-plus years now. Oh, it's so a fat it's, pet. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. this thing need, <laughs> Sally <laughs> May's got <laughs> Sally May's gotten to be a toxic bother. She needs oh, to go. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. yes, and we've gotten it down. I mean, no, we, we had no, before, you hadn't. You, you still owe fifty-eight. Gone, don't, don't tell me you guys. Fifty-eight thousand dollars. You, you you need to attack this with complete focus yeah. and temporarily for a short period of time, year to a year okay. and a half. I'd stop my retirement and I would attack that with a vengeance, like my hair was on fire. And uh, if you do that, I mean, you put 30000 a year on it, you'll be done in two years. You put 60000 a year on it, you're done in one year. So somewhere between those two is probably where you're going to land. And I'd really dial it up and get after it, kiddo. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, if you're in over your head with student loans and tired of getting calls from collection agencies, if private student loan debt is taking away your financial peace and you don't see any way out, you need Y Refi. They're not a debt settlement company and they're not connected to a bank. Y Refi refinances defaulted private student loans that other places won't touch and gives you a custom loan built for you based on your ability to pay. So when you refinance your private student loan debt with Y Refi, you'll have a payment you can afford with a low fixed interest rate you couldn't get anywhere else to help you stick to your budget and work the debt snowball. And you can save thousands of dollars. To learn more about this custom refinancing option and a lump sum payoff option you could qualify for after 24 months, call 844-2-RAMSEY or go to yrefi.com slash Ramsey. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Our last caller, 40 years old, with a student loan that's been around forever. Still hanging out with a student loan at 40. $58,000 student loan. Um, and, of course, we are, most of us aware anyway, that student loan interest restarted September 1, and the payments will start in a couple of weeks here again in October. So we've got... Um, somewhere around 44 million Americans with $1.7 trillion in debt that have this uh, train barreling down the tracks at you. So we decided to help out because the name of our company is Ramsey Solutions. So we need to give some solutions, not just um, not just squawking about it. So we're going to do that tonight. If you want to join us, 7 p.m. tonight, Tuesday night, September the 12th, we are doing a live stream. And it's completely free. It is me, Jade Warshaw, and Rachel Cruz. We're going to be talking about student loan debt in America, how we got here, and how we're going to get out. Uh, it'll be in four or five hours from right now if you're listening to us live, but it is at 7 p.m. Central Time, Tuesday night, September the 12th. It's free. Just go to RamseySolutions.com slash student loans, and you can put in your email address, and uh, you'll be able to give the live stream a free watch. We'll send you the link. Pretty simple. Patricia is up next in Roanoke, Virginia. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Good. Thank you. I have a question about my auto. Okay. So my question is, my lease is coming up. Um, I went to the dealership, and the amount to buy it out is $27,000. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I don't know if I should just go ahead and buy the car or get a cheaper car and and be just kind of like debt-free because I will still have the mortgage. Do mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you have any money? Uh, I do have a savings of $30,000. Okay. Um, what is the car worth? Uh, 28000 so a thousand dollars over the price. Yeah. So it's no bargain. It's an okay deal, mm-hmm. but you can probably get that deal on a used car lot. So there's yes. there's nothing that says to buy this car. 
if you were sitting with um, no car right now and you told me you had $30,000, I would not tell you to buy a $28,000 car. Because mm-hmm. you only have $30,000. That would be using up all of your money. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm going to toss them the keys when this lease is up and go buy you about a $10,000 car. What do you make a year? Uh, it depends. But the minimum, 55000 It depends how much I work, to be honest. Yeah. Well, the maximum car you ought to buy would be f- uh, 50% of your income. So that puts you at about you know 25000 bucks. But that's too much car because you don't have the money. So if I woke up in your shoes, I would have no car payment and be driving a very nice, gently experienced $10,000 car. Now, the difference in a $10,000 car and a $30,000 car is pretty substantial. But it's mm-hmm. not its not like it's unreliable. It's not like it's not safe. It's not like it's any of those things. What is unreliable is being broke. What is unsafe is being broke. And $2,000 with a $30,000 car when you make 65000 is broke. I wouldn't put you there. So I wouldn't buy that car, and I wouldn't buy anything anywhere near that price. Uh, now, if you told me you had 100000 in savings, yeah, and you love this car, maybe. But uh, even then, it's a lot of car for someone with your income. A lot, lot of money tied up. Yeah, I, I, I've been shopping, Dave. You know this for teenagers. You can get really decent cars uh, in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range, even in this so-called you know used car inflationary period, you can do it. You just have to swallow your pride and go, wait a second. I'd rather have more money than so-called pride. And you can get really decent cars that are functional and still in good shape. It's very doable. I look all the time. I got two more to buy next year. I'm a used car expert, Dave. At least I'm <laughs> self-proclaimed. You know, but I mean that's reality. Well, you're finding stuff out there that's safe. Yes, it's got a lot of life left in it. Yes. It's not filthy. It's not it's trash not, on it's the not, inside. Not, I mean, a fifteen thousand dollars car is not a hoopty. No, you know, it's a nice car. I just got my son Ty a Ford Explorer, two thousand twelve Ford Explorer. Just give you an example, twelve thousand dollars. Bought it from a nice local businessman. Had it in his his HVAC. If I said the name, you'd know him. And it was sitting in their parking lot. They've treated it wonderfully. It's in phenomenal shape. His eyes about bugged out of his head. And mine, too. I didn't expect to get him something that nice at that price range. But uh, it's a fantastic car, barely over 100,000 miles. Wow. So, got I mean, this, lot, isn't, got a lot of years left this isn't fantasy. I'm not just saying this. No, it's, it's doable. Yeah, that, that's what we would do in your shoes. Kennedy is in Indianapolis. Hi, Kennedy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Um, okay, so this is actually for Ken, um, more so. So I applied for, um, an, I'm in a position. I've been in it for a year and a half. I meet all the qualifications to get promoted to a senior position per the guidelines that my job laid out. The only thing I'm missing is the year and a half of in the same position. I've worked for the company for almost five years come February, but I've been in this position for a year and a half. They want me to be in it for three, but I have all the other qualifications. And they're like, we're sorry, we can't do anything because you don't have the extra year and a half, so you just have to sit there for a year and a half before we will promote you. I don't know how to get around that. I'm doing everything extra. I listened to you a couple days ago and you were like, you know, just, I asked my boss, hey, I want to be promoted. I want to be a manager. This is what I want to do. What do I have to do Mm -hmm. to get it? And she said, you've got to wait a year and a half. Yeah. So. Anything I can do. No. You have to decide. (laughs) Do Do you you want want to be there? Do you want to work there? Because they have laid out for you what is required. Mm -hmm. And, you know, listen, this this is the tension between patience and persistence. You know, we want to move forward. We want progress. But it requires patience. And so now they've laid it out very clearly for you. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm really impressed that they held the line on what they mm. prefer. I'm not. They sound like a bunch of idiot bureaucrats. <laughs> well, then there's Dave's opinion. I mean, uh, really. I mean, but, why but they, would you? I'll tell you the woman, why. The woman's been there five years. She'd be promoted at Ramsey. Well, but we don't if know she meet, anything well, about the organization. She maybe. meets all the other qualifications. The only thing she hadn't done is sit on her butt in that one role for a year and a half. All right, so let me clarify. Yeah. I don't necessarily have to agree with it. I respect the fact that they were clear and they've held the line I'll and they're consistent. So the point is they communicated clearly to you is what I was saying, yeah. and I respect yeah, which that. gives you the opportunity to leave. So now you get to decide. Do you want to wait okay. another year and a half or do you want to move on? So, so here's the ultimate... If you knew that they changed their mind today, 
Would you be mm-hmm. super excited about the present and the oh, future I with totally this company? Would. Well, then, yes. then I love it. I love the company. It's just I I don't want to be stuck in the same role I am. I want to get promoted. I feel like I've deserved to get promoted because I have All right, done let me ask more you this. than gone above. All right, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with Dave that their uh, that their uh, it's requirement it's well, is it arbitrary yes. or or do they tie it to actual hours? I don't even know what you do. Is it arbitrary or is no. it legit? Um, what it, that they require further. three years of experience. So in their requirement, they have eight different sections, and you have to meet above 50, 50% in eight of those sections. And then the requirement is minimum of three years in the same position doing the same role. And I have that from, like, outside experience, but not three years with uh, the company. So not three years with them. Okay. I get it. All right. Yeah. I get what Dave is saying, But she's too. been there five years. Yeah, I think you should get the but gig. But I've been with them for five years. Yeah, listen, I agree with Dave you should get the gig, but I at least appreciate they've told you. So now you got to deal with it. I don't think you okay. being the squeaky wheel is going to change their policy. Some people in some companies like policy more than well, they this do principle. Big, this big company, too. Of course. It? Yes. Guaranteed. Yeah. It's a, it's a policy over principle. Yeah, they, have, they have more rules than sense. That's all they do. They don't think, well, wait a second. This lady's got this experience outside of here. She more than meets the requirement. That's not the way they think. So you got to decide, do I want to be here and deal with the way they think, or do I want to move on? Unfortunately, that's what you're left with. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I mean, they do have the right to do that. It's, it's their right. They own it. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people don't agree with stuff I do here. And it's got my name on the building, though. I do whatever I want to do. <laughs> that's right. But you don't have to agree with it. But, and then sometimes they leave because they don't agree with it. And that, that's an option. That's, that's an option, too. Yep. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Ken. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey baby steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thank you for joining us, America. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, host of the Ken Coleman Show, and author of the number one selling book, From Paycheck to Purpose. He helps people with their careers, their jobs, and their work. And he's going to be doing that today right here on The Ramsey Show. Phone number here is 888-825-5225. Louisa is with us in Washington, D.C. Hi, Louisa. How are you? Good afternoon. So great to be speaking with you today. Thank you so much for taking my call. Thank you. What's up? All right. I've got a what would Dave do scenario, and I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, but I kind of just want to walk through some options I have, and it's concerning my mortgage. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of background. Um, I have an arm um, that resets every November, and um, it hasn't really been, you know, much of an issue until recently, obviously, because the rates have gone up. So Mm -hmm. it is resetting from four and a half to six and a half percent. Joyful. Um, Yep, the balance on the loan is ninety nine thousand. I've actually paid off fifty two thousand in the last year, mm-hmm. and I am on track to pay this off. My goal is December of twenty twenty five. Okay, so here are the scenarios. I just want to walk through. Want to get your thought? Um, option one is just to you know st- stick with you know stick with the the new payment coming up in November. Um, my payment is actually going down $100, $180, even with the rate going up because I've paid off so much. So it's actually going down um, $180. So that's option one is just proceeding with, you know, 6.5%. Um, and then, you know, we'd, the rate would reset, you know, next year. Option two uh, is a recast. And I've kind of read where you're not a big fan of a mortgage recast um, and want to get your thoughts on this. So obviously the rate would stay the same, 6.5%. Um, this would require a twenty thousand dollar payment um, 
by the end of October, and that would lower the payment $140 a month. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's option two. And then Why would you three, want to lower it if you're paying it off in two years? What's the benefit? Uh, well, I, I guess that's where I, I, I think... I don't, I don't understand. Okay. It's like we're trying to pay it off in two years or two and a half years, right? Right. right. And, and I, so and why, I, how does lowering the payment accomplish that? Um, I mean, it's lowering the interest that I'm paying. Right? No, it's not. I mean, that would be... No, it's not. Um, if you recast, are you going to recast at a lower interest rate? No, I'm okay. recasting. I'm taking it from a balance of 99000 to... Oh, it would lower the balance. Se- yeah. So but you could it, do that it, anyway. You don't have to recast yeah. to do that. Yes, I could. And yeah. that's what I've been doing is just recast. Pay all off. recasting does is reset the payment based on a longer term. It doesn't change the interest right. charged. Right. Right. Okay. So there's no benefit right. to you mathematically to recast. Okay. Given that you're planning to pay it off in two years. Yes. Correct. Okay. And here's the other thing is that I, it, I don't have $20,000 just sitting around. Right? Well, then it's there's that. Yeah. To, Right, exactly. So that kind of brings me to option three. Um, and let me let me just preface this by saying I heard you about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, before the rates, you know, were creeping up. Because I was going to re- refinance, and I remember you telling a caller, "Don't refinance if you can pay it off in three years." So I kind of went with that model, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm on I'm on target. I'm on track to pay this off. Mm-hmm. And that that is really why I did not refinance. Mm-hmm. Um, but option three would be digging into my brokerage account and paying it off entirely. I have I have about two hundred thousand dollars I'd have to cash, you know. Not in a thing. retirement? You have a brokerage account sitting there with enough to pay uh, it off? Uh, yes, I do. Mm. Pay it off today. <laughs> and yeah, I knew You knew I was gonna that. do that. Um, I, I did, I did. I still yeah. wanted to walk through the options. Okay. So if if with, you had a paid for home with a brokerage account with $100,000 less in it, would you go borrow $99,000 on your paid-for home to put more money in your brokerage account? No. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think think I'm just having some... uh, Let me tell you what's going to happen, all right, that you don't anticipate, because I've been the other side of it myself and with a whole bunch of other people. You do not understand when you pay this off and you walk out in the backyard with no shoes on that the grass is going to feel so much different. There's going to be a level of peace blow through your home like a nice cool wind that you don't even know is coming. When you owe no man Uh nothing, Uh All this hand wringing you've been doing for the last few minutes trying to figure out what to do, all that's gone. Just clean and simple. You just right. own your house. You're weird. Right. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And listen, if you really hate it, then go get you a new mortgage. Yeah. But I don't think you're going to hate it. I think you're going to yeah, feel freedom that you have not felt in your adult life. Yep. And I know that All from right. the having experienced it myself, because I don't have any debt and haven't had for 30 years. And I walk around without all of these weights on my shoulders and um, that, that a lot of people have. And I get to make different decisions and have a different level mm-hmm. of calm in the middle of a storm and all of that. Pay off your house, Louisa, please. I promise you, you won't regret it. But if I'm completely bonkers and you do regret it, you can always go get you another mortgage. And theoretically put it back in the brokerage. There's a fear there. You can hear it. Yeah. Well, no, it's just this angst of the devil I know. Yeah, that's right. The devil I know versus the peace I've never known. Uh-huh. And um, it, it's, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. I don't know if, the, which is the correct thing. And, and let me just tell you, man, when you get no payments in the whole freaking world, Financial peace. Two words that don't go together, like airline service. (laughs) Man. Wow. 
like postal service. Sorry to you, postal people. Oh my gosh. Sorry to you, airline people. I mean, really, I mean, it's financial peace, two words that don't go together. I mean, I've got money in a brokerage. I've got my emergency fund. I've got retirement going and I own my whole freaking house. Some of you need to breathe that in and make that a goal. Mm. Some of you spend a lot of calories flipping stuff over in your head, wringing your hands, trying to figure out something, when the answers are usually pretty simple. Clean it up, people. Simplify, simplify. That's it, simplify. Yeah. Oh, it's hard to beat, guys. Hard to beat. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, Dr. John Deloney here with some great news. You get to choose. Whatever you do, good or bad moving forward, the choice is yours. And when you're intentional about making good choices over time, they become healthy habits, like choosing to slow down and make time for a daily practice of prayer and meditation. One thing that has helped me with a daily practice of meditation and prayer is hallow. Hallo is the number one prayer app in the world, and they're giving you three months free to get started. That's three months free to prioritize your mental health and be intentional about finding peace through calming music, prayers, meditation, and more. And Hallow isn't just Catholic. You can tailor the content towards your faith tradition. If you don't have a faith tradition, this is a great place to learn more about it. From scripture readings and prayers to journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice mindfulness, build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life, and choose peace. Remember, Hallow is giving you 90 days free. Imagine the peaceful habits you can establish in 90 days. Go to hallow.com slash Ramsey today and follow the simple prompts to start your free 90-day trial. That's hallow.com slash Ramsey. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Our question of the day for the Ramsey Show is sponsored by Neighborly, your hub for home services, from repairs and maintenance to remodeling and upgrades. Neighborly's trusted home service providers have trained local experts who can handle almost any job. So go to Neighborly.com to find and schedule service today. Today's question comes from Roger in South Carolina. I'm a 20-year-old male currently studying aerospace engineering. I know the aerospace industry is very cyclical, so I was wondering if having a one-year salary emergency fund would be a good idea before having kids. Well, I'm sitting next to the guy who... uh, created the concept i i don't think a year is necessary and and i don't know enough to understand why he believes the aerospace industry is so cyclical but six months uh if you're in kind of a a topsy-turvy industry like that i think would be good i don't i don't hate having a one-year emergency fund but is it necessary no with roger his credentials? roger you're an engineer you <laughs> overanalyze things <laughs> Your job is to perceive risk, and so you see risk everywhere, but there's not that much risk. You will be fine. If you have an aerospace engineering degree, you will be able to get a job and feed your family sometime in the six-month period. Yeah, six months is fine. But um, And here's the other thing. The more money you put into that, the slower you build wealth. The faster you build wealth, the less you worry about an emergency fund. If you got a million dollars in a mutual fund, and $5,000 in mutual in an emergency fund, you don't have enough in your emergency fund. 
but you got a million dollars in a mutual fund, so you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, so the faster you build wealth, the less you have to worry about any of this. So you're going to be just fine. Tom's in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave and Ken. Uh, I just want to say, starting off, um, your principles have you know changed my, my wife's life and my life. So just wanted to thank you guys for your ministry. Thank you. How can we help? Yeah. Um, so... So, uh, so getting to my question, a little bit of context. Um, last month, I actually called Ken, uh, called Ken on his show, and I was just laid off from my mortgage loan officer job, actually working at Wells Fargo, and uh, I was looking for places to basically trying to figure out references, and Ken gave me great advice, and a month later, I now have a job at a, a Toyota dealership um, selling cars, so really exciting. Uh, I guess my main question is, is a lot of people are coming in, they're financing their car, uh, they're leasing their cars. In fact, you know, there's some incentive for us to push leases just because from our standpoint, you know, that creates repeat customers. Now, none of this stuff is stuff that I would recommend to my loved ones. I would never do it myself. Um, is there, am I in the wrong if I'm in a position where I'm, where I'm sometimes selling these? Uh, if, so, if so, should I consider changing jobs or what, what are your thoughts? Well, I don't, you're not ethically doing anything wrong. This is not any legal activity. But because you don't believe in it, we don't believe in it either, but this is about your principles. Eventually, this is going to eat away at you. So short term, uh, I, I would be looking for something to make a transition because long term, this will eat away at you. And, and listen, you know, I talk about engagement all the time. I study the data. Listen, a person who doesn't believe in the mission, the product, the service of a company is not going to be fully engaged. And that has a lot of negative effects, financial opportunities for you, promotional opportunities. It affects your health, your mental health and beyond. So I think long term, if I'm a guy like you that has a strong principle conviction that you have, I would eventually move on from selling something that you just don't believe in. Yeah, it's it's not something you have to run out of the hair building today like your hair's on fire, like yeah. you discovered the boss had twenty pounds of cocaine in his office. You don't right. you don't hang out there another day. Okay, that's not what's going on. This is uh you know a disagreement of how the product works. And so uh Rabbi Lappin talks about the in his book, he's my good friend, Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and he wrote a book called Thou Shall Prosper. And um, the book is the 10 reasons that Jewish people have had an inordinate probability of being financially successful in any point in human history. They tend to thrive. And why is that? One of the things is they believe that making money is an honorable thing if you're doing an honorable thing. And uh, one of the things he points out in that chapter it's one of the 10 things is that it's uh, if you're doing something that's psychologically incompatible with your belief system, it's very difficult to be good at it. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, the back, that's another way of saying exactly what Ken said. And so, yeah, I'm completely aligned with what Coleman is saying here. If I were in your shoes, I would say, I'm going to give myself 60 days and I'm going to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, because they're, 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 they're they are going to sell car leases because they make more money right, on car, right. not because of repeat customers, but because they make more money on car leases than they do on the actual sale of the car. And they make more money on car leases than they do if they do a regular finance plan with a bank. And uh, they make more money on car leases than they do just about anything else. It's the one of the most profitable parts of the entire auto industry now. And so it's massively profitable for them. This paper is amazing. And so they're, they're not only go, not going to not stop it, they're going to push it because it's where they make their money. And so that's how it is. It's like there's a, a series of articles have gone around the last few years that if you work at Victoria's Secret selling uh, small underwear, right, <laughs> you, you have to sell a certain number of Victoria's Secret credit cards ah. or they will not give you hours. Oh, okay. Because they're in more in the credit card business than they are the small underwear business. Right. Small underwear is there just to get you into the credit card debt. Interesting. Into big debt. Mm. Small underwear, big debt. There it is. So there you go. That's, <laughs> that's how it works. It's a great well, slogan. You ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to box that one up and sell it. You know, that's anyway, yeah. That's uh, so. But if you if you want to work there in that store in the retail store, uh, you're not going to get hours. That's right. You're not going to pre be promoted if you don't sell credit cards. Even if you sell a whole bunch of small underwear and you don't sell any credit cards, you're going to be on the street. They, 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 you know, 
But that's the business they're in. They know where their money's coming from. They know what the profit centers are, and they're going to drive you that way. Yeah. So then you've got to decide, mm-hmm. if, as an employee, are you going to plug into that? And I think you've already decided. Oh, sure. Tom, yeah. I think he's already on He had already decided. And just yeah. wants permission. Is this silly? No, it's not silly at all. No, it's smart. Brian is in Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, Brian, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. How you doing today? Better than I deserve. What's up? Oh, glad to hear it. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I'll give you a little background information on myself. Um, I'm 40 year old. I have two kids. My wife's a stay at home mom. We own a town home. We owe, we owe about 55,000 left on it. Um, uh, my wife has some savings around 60 K and I'm debating whether I should use that money to pay off the house or if I should invest it, um, like in an IRA or something for the future. Um, but the thing is we're in a small town home and we're looking to get some a little bit more, a little bit more space for, you know, for the family because kids are sharing a room. I got a boy and a girl. When are you, when are you moving? Oh, we're not moving at all yet. We just, we'd like to get another property because we like to have. Well, I mean, is this like two years or a year or 10 minutes? Oh, it's probably the next couple of years. Okay. Two, three years. Pay it off. Pay it off? Today. Okay. Today. The reason I ask is my financial advisor tells me not to because he says my interest rate on my home is going to be less than what I'd be making in the stock market. That's why I figured yeah, I'd guess what? double check with you. Guess what? He doesn't make a dime when you pay off the house. He makes a commission when you invest the money with him. I understand that. Hello. Okay. Ding, 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 ding. And I didn't make a dime either way. So you do whatever you want to do. But if I woke up in your shoes, I'd have a paid for house. Now, you need to get yourself on a budget, and you need to sit down with another financial advisor that's not giving you stupid butt advice and get you an IRA started and get your kids for get your kids 529 started, and let's get some investing going and get yourself on a budget with your wife and the two of you working together. Let's get detailed and dial this money stuff in, man, because it kind of feels like you're loosey-goosey running out here just for trying to figure this out as you go, and you need to dial it in and make sure every dollar is barking. Every dollar is doing what it's supposed to do. So get in the Every Dollar app, get in Financial Peace University, do that kind of stuff. But uh, if I woke up in your shoes, I'd pay my house off today, dude, just like that. No question. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey guys, being free to make your own medical decisions is a big deal these days. Christian Healthcare Ministries gives members the freedom to choose the doctors and providers they want without the frustration of worrying about networks and with no waiting period to join. It's a membership-based nonprofit ministry where hundreds of thousands of Christians share funds to pay for and pray for each other's medical bills. For over 40 years, CHM has helped families living across all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Check out more today at chministries.org slash budget. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. If you like what you hear around here, you could help us out, and we'd appreciate it. Click the follow button, the subscribe button, the share button. Share the show. Share a link. Tell people where you're listening on talk radio or TBN or whatever it is. Spread the word about the show. And leave a five-star review. They're very helpful. All of those things, the share, the like, the uh, subscribe, the follow, all of those things really push the show to the front of the algorithms and cause people to find us. And it doesn't cost you a thing, and we would appreciate the help. Thank you very much. Trevor is in Salt Lake City. Hi, Trevor. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. 
Thanks for having me, Dave. I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, I grew up watching, grew up listening to your show with my parents, so huge fan of yours. Well, thank you. Um, I got a question. I got a question for you um, regarding um, either reinvesting in my business or purchasing a home, and I can give you a little bit of information about it. So I'm 23 years old. Um, I'm getting married in a week. Wow. And I – thank you. Good for you. Congrats. I, thank you. Um, between me and my fiance, we have about $50,000 in our savings account. Uh, we have no debt. Um, my business has about $75,000 in assets. Um, as well as I have about $25,000 in investments, mutual funds, CDs, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just wondering, with your expert opinion, what I should do if I should reinvest in my business um, to continue to grow it, or whether or not I should look into purchase, purchasing a home. At How much time. do you need to reinvest in the business, and why? Um, so the reason I'm reinvesting in my business, I just bought a new Skidster. I do landscaping. Um, I've been able to pay everything, cash, trailers, equipment. Um, I just got a new skidster and I'm looking to purchase a second truck. Um, I have three employees. Um, so looking to have a second truck for them as well as a new trailer, um, and just upgrading some of our mowing equipment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you spend that money, you're going to spend what? 20, 30,000 bucks. Correct. And what does that cause you to make? Because you spent that. That you wouldn't make um, if you so didn't I, spend it. Okay, so this uh, I'm anticipating this year to make about eighty thousand. Um, that's after uh, taxes, everything, mm-hmm. um, and I'm anticipating if I can get that reinvestment, um, I can make an additional twenty to thirty. Um, so you can make the money back in a year. In next year. Um, yes, probably. You spend about twenty or thirty. You make an extra twenty or thirty as a result. Correct. Okay. And it sounds like and you got seventy five thousand dollars. Um, correct, okay. and that's in equipment. Um, and you, trucks, you make uh, trailers. No, no, no. You you have seventy five thousand cash. You have twenty five in a mutual fund and fifty in your account, right? Uh, yeah, okay. approximately. All right. And uh, what does your wife make? Um, she makes about forty a year. And you're going to net on your business a hundred. Uh, no, I'm anticipating 80 this year. I reinvested quite a bit this year. I just bought the Skidster about two weeks ago. Um, so that ran me a little bit. And I do owe, um, the only debt I have is I owe my father who um, was gifted me 15000 towards my Skidster I bought. So I'm going to pay him back. Was um, that a gift or a loan? Uh, a loan, more or less. Well, that's an interesting piece of information for a guy for 10 minutes has been telling me he was debt free. You're not debt free. You owe your dad 15 grand. No, yeah, you're I'm not going to invest off. in your business. You're going to be paying your dad back. I'm, I will pay it off in the next month. So oh, no, today. I... You have the money in your account right now. You shouldn't have taken it from him in okay. the first place. Okay. You got 50,000 bucks. You need to borrow 15,000 from your dad. Correct. I just wanted to keep some money in an emergency fund where where I am self employed. I just and getting married. I wanted to be able to yeah, have the money. Yeah. Should have bought a skid steer that way. If you needed the money, if you need the money for an emergency fund, you shouldn't have bought a skid steer. But you bought one now, and now you got a loan, and now you got to pay it off. I'd pay that off today. Um, okay. And then what I would do is get married and spend the first year of your marriage piling up cash for a good down payment on a house. And after you've been married a year, you will make a different purchase than after you've been married a week. It's a different house. Okay. It takes a year of being married to know how close to your mother-in-law or your father-in-law who loans you money for skid steers that you want to live. How close do you want to live with these people? Yeah. It takes a year to figure that out. So, um, that's a joke, but not really. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, there's a lot of truth to that. The other thing, too, is is there, I would be challenging myself, how can I make an additional fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year over the next year of my business without spending twenty to thirty? You know, yeah. get innovative, uh, and, and, and especially in that first year of marriage. He was already worried. That's why he took the loan out from his dad, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, Trevor, you need to quit buying toys for your business that you haven't done a careful ROI on because you're not going to get an ROI on this skid steer. That's bull crap. You're not going to make enough on that thing to justify having purchased it. You would have made you would have been better off buying mowing equipment to expand your operation than, than with the skid steer. So quit buying business toys that don't have very fast, large ROI. Stop it. I had a friend of mine that's in the building business, and he bought a skid steer. 
Now, I bought a skid steer the other day, too. Did you really? There's one out at the farm. For you? But I bought it for no reason at all, except I have the money, and it's a toy. You like moving dirt around. Well, I got my grandson in my lap digging up stuff that doesn't even need to be dug up. All right, so this is embarrassing. This won't surprise Dave at all, but... You guys are throwing skid steer around, skid steer this, skid steer that. You don't even know what that. this is, do you? I had to Google it real quick, James. It's a bobcat. It's a bobcat. I, that okay. I would have known. It, it's a bobcat on tracks. It's pretty cool it's looking little tracks. machine. If it's on tracks, it's a skid steer. Right. Yeah, so, so basically, you, Papa Dave, got his own real life Tonka. It's a toy. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> your, what I did. It is. It's great. Yeah. And good for you. Yeah, it's fun. Because your grandson thinks that's really oh, cool. Oh, my God, man. It's a giant Tonka. There's no cooler Papa Dave in the world than one with a skid steer. So, what I'm hearing is live like an ONL so later you can can dig holes for no reason at all <laughs> yes <laughs> to make your grandson happy that's the dream hey, of every grandfather hey, every four-year-old's dug a hole for no apparent reason and right. every 64 year old apparently is going to do the same you thing, never so. get over it <laughs> i was going to say live so live just, like no just, one just else so the public knows i'm not anti-skid steer okay i'm just no. saying but from a business perspective <laughs> don't buy stuff that you can't roi quickly every and i gotta tell you here's an interesting thing Working with uh, people in Entree Leadership, Mm -hmm. very few women do this in business. It's kind of a male thing. Yeah. It's a male stupid thing. It's toys. And they do it with with computers. Right. The guys that do all this equipment stuff in here, Mm -hmm. I have to constantly go, no, we don't need another one. All right. Good God, how many microphones (laughs) do I need to own? Seriously. (laughs) But they, they, oh, the, the boys collect toys, man. There's yeah. just something about it. And I, I, ladies, they, they're very careful. But oftentimes I have to get them to go the other way. It's hard to get them to do the actual investment they need to do. Right. To, to, because they're conservative on it. But very few women in business collect toys like boys do. And you know what's interesting? I'll bet you can prove this. They're much more resourceful as well. Think about the mom who always makes the science project happen under the wire, you know, with a couple of straws, you know, a, a rubber band here. It's like you can build that business, that landscaping business without that new truck. You can't. You just got to be innovative. And that's yeah. where innovation comes from is when we have a lack of resources. Craig Groeschel talks about that a lot. Uh, yeah. In fact, he he's the one that it was mind blowing. I think I interviewed him years ago when I was hosting Entree Leadership. It's one of the best thoughts on innovation that I've ever heard is from Craig Rochelle. Yeah. It creates a lack creates a lack a, of a necessity yeah. to become creative on how yeah. you're going to do it. If you can't do it any other way. Yeah. And so that's why your dad did you no favor loaning you that money. Right. So that, that's the thing. Hmm. So all that to pick on you, Trevor, because we love you and we want you to win. So pay off your dad today, uh, get a little apartment and uh, set up house and concentrate on loving each other, not on stupid real estate deals for the first year of your marriage. And after you've been married a year and saved up a little more money above your emergency fund and you're truly debt free, and the next time you tell somebody you're debt free, make sure you are, uh, then uh, then from there, you, pay, you put down with a, a good strong down payment on a 15 year fixed after you've been married a year. That's what I would do if I were in your shoes. Congratulations on the marriage. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything, from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. 
Visit Blinds.com to save up to 40% off everything site-wide. Go to Blinds.com for more information. Ken Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thanks for hanging out with us, America. This is the Ramsey Show. We're so glad you're here. Hey guys, uh, George Camel and the Every Dollar team are hosting a free live virtual training for your budget. Yeah, you're going to learn how to find more margin in your finances, to spend without guilt, and to make a budget that actually works. First one is happening September the 19th at 1230 Eastern Time. Spots are limited. You can pick one with George. Uh, Jade Warshaw is going to be doing some. I think Rachel Cruz might be doing another one, too. So uh, all these budgeting webinars are completely free. Go to everydollar.com slash budgeting and we'll help you get started with this stuff all right here we go josh is in orlando hi josh welcome to the ramsey show hey never grow up especially if you can afford it right gentlemen <laughs> that's right there's the plan what's up man <laughs> okay so i have a pro and a con so here's my dilemma and i'm actually so i'm trying to get as debt free as i possibly can i have uh 17 no about 19 20 thousand dollars in credit card debt and then that's my primary, and then my secondary is my auto loan, which I'm about eleven thousand upside down. Um, and re- in regards to my credit card, um, I have eighteen thousand in RSU uh, shares from my company, and then I have seven thousand dollars in a traditional IRA. Wanted to know if I should uh, use my stock to my use. Wanted to know if I should use both to pay off my credit card debt. I would not use an IRA. I would use your stock. Okay. And the reason for not using the IRA? Penalties and taxes. Okay. Leave those so alone. Actually, and I would quit adding to the IRA, and I would cut okay. up the credit cards and never touch the stupid things again. Get a debit card. Okay. Do not even own a credit card. Okay. 100%, 100%. And then what about the IRA to where I cash it out, I have it in a savings account? You already have? Yeah. I, uh, well, I, I, did, I did a transfer. Or I, I did the, the part of the work, but I haven't fully transferred it to my saving, my personal savings account. When did you do this? Uh, I did it last Friday to where it was effective for me to utilize today. Okay. Uh, well, you've got 60 days to undo it without penalty. And so okay. I'm going to get, get go to RamseySolutions.com and click on Smart Vester and find a Smart Vester Pro in the area to help you undo it and get it back into an IRA before you get hit with the penalties and the taxes. How much was okay. in that? You said there's only like seven thousand in the account, though, right? Yeah, it was only, it was only seven. Yeah, so you're probably only going to lose three or four thousand bucks, but that's still a ridiculous. I mean, you're paying forty percent interest effectively to get the money freed up. I would not do that. I think it's a good practice for you to learn to leave that alone. So let's roll that back into while you're in the sixty day window. Back, you know, get you an IRA set up with a with a SmartVestor Pro, and um, then then start your. Um, I'm sorry, then cut up your credit cards and pay them all off. And then you've still got to clean up your auto loan. That's your next thing. So beans and rice, rice and beans, no adding to any investments of any kind. Uh, and we're completely focused on clearing this debt. That's the next process there. So good question. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Tyler is in Jacksonville, Florida. Hi, Tyler. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. How's it going? Better than I deserve. What's up? Yeah, so I got a a little bit of a dilemma here with uh, some in-laws, I guess. Give you a backstory. I'm married, uh, moved away from home, and uh, I guess I said in-laws, but my my parents uh, moved away from home, and you know, they're my mother's not in a great financial situation. Um, she hasn't been working um, and, and has some tax issues from a past business, and she's asking to borrow some money to make a house payment. And, um, you know, I feel led to 
Um, but I'm also trying to talk to her in the, in the nicest way possible to try to sort out a longer term plan than, you know, make a payment. And then what do we do next month? And what do we do next month? Uh, my siblings, uh, aren't as financially capable to, to help. So I feel like how old are you, Tyler? Kind of falling to me. What was that? How old are you? Uh, 28. How old's your mother? Um, 57. Okay. On what planet is the 28 year old supposed to take care of the 57 year old that was too trifling to do it herself? <laughs> yeah, it's not your job, yeah, man. That's... It's not your job. Yep. And I bet your wife yeah, so. isn't happy with this either. Um, no. No, no what do you make a year? Of, um, combined, we're making probably 250 260 You're making bank, aren't you? Good for you. Okay. What is your mom doing? Nothing. Calling Tyler for money. Is she not working at all? No, not, a, no, not currently. Um. Uh, well, take me back. So I guess, yeah, when 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 was she working? Um, it's been a while. Uh, she, Why? She had a housing housing company quite a while ago. And Why is she, she not working? That. Um, um, not a there's not a good reason. I yeah, guess. I don't think so either. Okay, so you giving her money is not sustainable because you were correct in your wisdom when you observed that you're going to be doing it again next month and next month and next month and next month because you're enabling her mm -hmm. bad behavior. Yeah. Instead, what I would do is come alongside her and say, Mom, I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader. I'm going to give you some suggestions and some help and show you what to do so you can straighten this out. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get into Ken Coleman's book, uh, From Paycheck to Purpose, and we're going to get you a job and a career. And then I'm going to put you on to every dollar on a budget, and you're going to make money and pay your own bills, and you're going to like yourself more when you do that. I am not going to pay your bills, Mom, but I will be here for you. I love you, and I will help you figure out a way to pay your bills. And she's not going to like that, Tyler, because she likes doing nothing. Yeah, yeah, I think that could be the case. Yeah, she's going to get angry with you, and she's going to become a travel agent with, for guilt trips, mm. which is what codependent people do when their enabler cuts them off. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is going to be tough, but you're being very wise. I'm not trying to just be mean to your mom. I, I'm disrespecting yeah, her. Yeah, I'm, I'm disrespecting her because her behaviors are awful. But I'm not trying to be mean to her. She needs to change her behavior so that she has a quality life. She's 58 freaking years old. There's nothing wrong with this woman. She could get a job and pay her bills instead of mooching off her 28-year-old son. And so she, it's good for her. She's going to like herself better. All the other brothers and sisters are going to like her better. Um, everybody's going to be a lot happier when mom gets her crap together. Am I missing something? No, no, I think that's right. I just, yeah, it's kind of what well, you said, just trying to figure out the, the best way to yeah. go about it without, you know, being mean. I yeah, you're, you're not being mean when you don't give a drunk a drink. It's not good for a drunk to have a bottle of Jack Daniels. It's not good for a heroin addict to be, uh, to be loaded up with heroin. It's not good for them. They don't like it when you tell them no. But it's not good for them. This is not good for your mom. Loving your mom well is helping her get a life that is not filled with chaos, a life that's not filled with uncertainty, and a life that's not, un that's not sustainable. And it doesn't have any dignity. And so, um, now, again, I don't, you know, you're not being mean. Now, she's going to tell you you're being mean. That's so mean. You have plenty of money. What's wrong with you, Tyler? I raised you. You can give me a little. Mm. Th that's what it sounds like. Yeah. That's exactly what it's going to sound like coming back at you. That's called a travel agent for guilt trips. She's going to pitch one on you. I'd you be know. more worried about upsetting my wife than I would be upsetting my mom. And I think that's what this is going to come down to. I would to. be worried that I'm doing harm to my own mother who I love. And there's that too. And but, when you mm. support the misbehavior, you're doing harm to them. Enablers are not helpers. 
They're cowards who won't say no. That's what they are. Don't be a coward. Love her well enough that you help her. For real help her. And if you want to put her through Financial Peace University, you call our team. We'll give it to you. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Ken. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. The phone number here is 888-825-5225. Thank you for joining us. Robin is in Phoenix. Hi, Robin. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for taking my call. Sure. I am going to retire in about three years at 76. I have no mutual fund and no 401k. My question is, should I buy or rent at that time at 76? Okay. How would you be able to buy if you don't have any money? Yeah, well... I've got these. I've got time. So currently, my income is forty five hundred a month. Two K is going to rent. Two K is going to student loans, and five. Um, I spend five hundred on um, daily on, on debt living. You know, living expenses. You, you, now, you're I seventy have, years old, and you have a student loan. Yes. Um, yes. And haven't paid it off yet, but I will pay it off. It's expected to be paid off in March of 24. Okay. What's the balance on it? 12,000. Wow. So I'm paying 2,000 a month on that. 2K. Okay. Yeah, 2K a month. All right. I, I'm really curious how you end up with a student loan at your age. How did you do that? Well, let's call paying the interest. I, I paid the interest only for a, a long time. So, what's a long time? Uh, since t- <laughs> since twenty twenty since twenty oh five, I guess that's when I graduated. You graduated in in oh five, so you graduated twenty years or eighteen years ago, and you've been paying. Yeah. And your degree is in what? A bet. That particular degree, that, I've got some more since that time, but that particular degree was in communications. Okay. All right. And what do you do for a living? I'm a quality inspector. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, the, the thing that runs through my head is this. Uh, obviously, you at retirement have to have monthly money to pay uh, an electric bill and buy food and uh, provide shelter, okay? Uh, The largest line item in your budget for the rest of your life, if you live to be 95, another 20-something years, is going to be um, housing. And if you're renting your cost of housing is going to go up every year because rent always goes up. Does that make sense? If you buy, at least you're locked in to what you're going to be spending on housing from this point forward. So buying is good. Having a paid off home by the time you get there is even better. And of course, having a nest egg to live on. So do you have a pension in the background of this or are you counting on just social yeah. security to feed you no um i'll finish the rest um so right currently what i have is a universal life policy that has 
a cash value approximately 9000 in it. I'm reluctant to cash it out because it has a long-term care rider of, a, of 50 months on it at 4%. So that's going to give me uh, fifteen about 1500 a month just for that. Now, as I shared, um, at the end, of, by the time I retire, I will have approximately $500 in pension and 2500 I'm guessing, 2500 in Social Security, which would give me 3000 And, and you have no month. money in savings at all? My $1,000. $1,000. I got my 1000 Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I want you so to cash the universal my- in and pay the student loan down. And let's be done with the student loan very quickly. Let's get that in the background as soon as possible so we can try to accomplish a couple of these other goals, which is housing, and start to build some kind of a nest egg over the next three years. So basically, you're going to live on beans and rice for the next three years while you throw as much money towards housing, buying a home, and as much money towards a nest egg as you can throw. And both of those are going to be better moves than a bad universal policy. So we've got to get the student loan in your rearview mirror to pull that off. So get the student loan in your rearview mirror, build an emergency fund, and then start saving for a down payment while you're putting at least 15% of your income or more into retirement. And I want you to save as much as you can save for retirement while putting down as much as you can put down on a house. Uh, and, And when you do buy a home, I want you to buy a very modest, a very inexpensive property. I am more yes, concerned I, that I, you have I, basic shelter that is locked in on its monthly cost than I am you having a home that you are necessarily thrilled with. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I want to stabilize. I'm trying to stabilize your future. That's what I'm that's my first goal. Your luxury or your comfort are secondary. But stabilizing the shelter aspects of your future next 20 years is really what I got to lean on. And uh wow. Wow. Well, the good news is I think you can actually make a pretty good dent in 36 months on this if you'll be very focused. Um, I think that might be one of the oldest student loan debt callers I've had. It, it's it's mind-boggling. I'm sitting there listening to that. And because we're having the student loan live stream tonight, uh, it's absolutely free. Uh, RamseySolutions.com, 7 p.m. Central, 8 Eastern. It, it, it's important to point out that she is – and I don't throw this word around lightly. You know this, Dave. She's a victim of this cultural message that has said, if you get a degree, you're going to get a raise. And sometimes that's true. Many times it's not. And she kept My getting last degrees, degree and degrees was in and degrees communications, and, and I'm not in communications. Exactly. She's in quality assurance. And so you've got to be careful. These degrees don't come with jobs. You still got to go out and find them, Ooh. get them. And perform them well. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be unkind, but there are so many people that still believe uh, you go through a layoff at 45 or at 50 and you go, I got to go get more education. Maybe. But probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Not at the cost of sitting at 70 years old to stop student loan debt. No. And see, that's the exchange that makes me so angry about. And let me just be honest. Let me be an equal opportunity offender, folks. Both sides of the political aisle are in the business of student loans. It's big business. It's a lot of money. And no one's talking about legislation or regulation. To stop it. To stop it and to take on the unbelievable inflation this is in the world of tuition. This is not doing a service. No. You people in government are not helping That's right. the population. No. You are harming the people that you're called to govern. It's a hidden tax, Dave. And... and, and People are getting filthy, stinking rich off the backs of people like her. And it really does need to stop. It really. I mean, seriously, would somebody grow a leadership backbone and send it to Washington, D.C.? This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Dr. John Deloney has a brand new book coming out called Building a Non-Anxious Life. You can pre-order the book right now for $20 and you'll get $75 in bonus items. Nearly half the U.S. population says their lives are affected by anxiety, stress, burnout. It's everywhere. But here's the thing. Anxiety isn't actually the problem. It's the symptom. The problem is we're unsafe, disconnected, unhealthy, living like we have no say in what happens next. And in this book, Dr. Deloney walks you through six daily choices to recognize and break free from a life that's spinning out of control. It is amazing. This book is selling like hotcakes, too, and we, it comes out technically October 3rd. If you pre-order, you get $75 in bonus items, which includes instant access to one of Dr. John's talks, newest talk, Smoke, Fire, and Freedom. This is a great talk. And also, you're going to get the ebook and the audio book. RamseySolutions.com, Building a Non-Anxious Life. Christopher is in Corpus Christi, Texas. Hi, Christopher. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave and Ken, thank you for having me on. Sure, what's up? So, let me give you a quick backstory. I'm recently engaged. Our wedding is in June. I have a full time job making 34000 a year. I also go to school full time to be a radiology tech. I have no debt, and I have an emergency fund of twenty k. Me and my fiance are on the same page about not going into debt for the wedding and not spending more than five k on our budget for the wedding. I recently made it to step four, but I'm confused if I should be investing 15% while also saving for a wedding and a down payment on a home. No, you ought to be saving for the wedding and for your education until you're married. Don't worry about a home and don't worry about retirement right now. Okay. You'll get, you got time to so, get to both right now. You need to get married, pay cash for the wedding. And, uh, even if you beef up the budget a little bit, that's okay. Your budget's not out of control on this wedding. And um, make sure you get through the school and pay cash for all of it. So you need the margin in your life to just be piling up cash right now until June. Right. Yeah, let's let's worry about it, retirement and worry about how buying a house a year or two from now. Okay, so I should just be saving. For the wedding like and, and for your life. Yeah, just pile up money right, right now. I want you to get. I want you to get your education finished. I want you to get married, lower lower stress on both of these with a big old pile of cash, and then when you get out and the wedding is over, if you've got a little money left over, that's your head start towards your emergency fund and towards your down payment. But you're, you're there's no don't don't you're putting too much pressure on yourself to try to do all these things at once. Okay, you so got time, man. Being... You got time. How old are you? I'm 24. You got plenty of time. You're gonna be okay. Christopher, I can hear your brain. You're processing what Dave's saying, but it's it. You're, something's got you hung up. What's going on? N- nothing. I just you're just goal oriented. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. But I I started school late, so uh, I just I'm doing my basics right now and my remedial courses. So I feel like I kind of started late in the game. So you feel be- like you're behind. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. You're not. You're not. You're you're way ahead because you actually yeah. know what you want to do. That's right. And you got and you're you're running down a, a very clearly defined track. Your plan, you laid it out perfectly in just a few moments on the air here in front of twenty million people. That that's impressive. I mean, you really yeah. that, that's a great job. Yeah. You're doing a whole lot better than it feels like you're doing. You're going to get to the other things. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm just saying don't worry about them now. To, a year from now, two years from now. We'll worry about those Mm -hmm. right now. Pay cash for the wedding, finish your degree, pay cash for that pile up money. It's all you need to do right now. And that's plenty. It's plenty making 34 K that's a big enough task as it is. Yeah. (laughs) You can do it all, but not at the same time. And I think that's pretty much true uh, in any area of life. So you're going to be okay and give yourself a break. I, there's, I could feel him beating up on himself a little bit. I'm behind. I'm behind. Yeah. No, you'll be okay. Yeah, you're the, not the behind. The fact of the matter is, with our plan, you're going to catch up with a lot of people. Oh, you, you're probably by March. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you know why? He's a tortoise, and he's focused, and the tortoise always wins that race. Every time. You're exactly right. Jeremy's in Houston. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. What's up? Yeah, so my primary question today, uh, and I probably just need to hear you say it, is trying to work out 
how much house I can really afford. Because when I start to look at the numbers, I I begin to feel like maybe I'm going a little bit crazy. And then it just kind of spirals into, should I ever even think about buying a place or should I rent forever? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a false narrative. You don't have to rent forever. That's not a real option. You know that. That's just drama queen. Right. (laughs) Well, no, I don't mean to sound dramatic, actually. I don't necessarily. No, but I mean, that happens. We have a little drama queen. All of us have a little drama queen in our head. (laughs) And that one's that. When you spiral out like that, that's the little drama queen in your head. I mean, you know you're not going to rent forever. And you know that's dumb because rent goes up every year. So renting is a good short-term plan, but it's not a good long-term plan. You already knew that, right? I, I sort of I sort of knew that, but I didn't actually feel that renting was necessarily – I don't mean it in a negative connotation. Oh, it's actually. negative. It's not a good idea long-term. I'll give it to you negative. It's Here's why it's negative. It's not because it's a class status thing. It's because your cost of housing goes up every year. For 45 or 50 years, you're going to pay more every single year if you rent. And, and that's that's a death knell to your finances versus if you own the value of the home is going up. And if you're making a payment on a fixed rate 15 year that we tell you to do, the payment is locked sure. in. The only reason it would change is taxes and insurance, but it won't change otherwise. And so you've locked in the largest line item in your budget, which is housing, and it's going up in value versus nothing is going up in value when you're renting long term and it, and your rent goes up every stinking year the largest line item in your budget takes up more of your money every year so you don't want to do that long term but you may want to do it for a year or two while you get the, some other things done like getting out of debt and getting your emergency fund in place and and then um let me just tell you uh one of the things you experience when you learn to live debt free is is that you are living like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else. And when you live within a reasonable budget on housing, there's going to be people around you that are buying a nicer house on a 30-year adjustable rate mortgage, maxing themselves out where they can't breathe, and they're taking on a house payment that is crazy as a percentage of their income. And they don't make any more than you make, and it looks like they're winning. They're not winning. They're destroying themselves. And meanwhile, you're over here uh, in, in a much more modest property feeling like you're losing, and the reality is you're winning. Does that, any of that sound right? No, it does sound right. And, and you know, the, the numbers make me feel a little bit crazy because I feel like I earn a pretty good living. What do you earn? In my situation – I make after taxes about 140,000. After taxes, after 401k, about 140,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we so say we say put a 15-year fixed that. rate, no more than a fourth of your take-home pay, and that's not counting 401k. That's just taxes coming out of your take-home pay. So what's your take-home pay? Not counting 401k, and a 15-year fixed rate. Interest rates are higher now than they were this time last year, obviously. Uh, the good, that's sure. the bad news. The good news is that, that um, you know, it's, well, uh, there's a shortage of housing, so we're still seeing house prices go up. But y- you can find a house. You probably can get a seller to give you some attention right now. Inventory is really low, but um, which is holding the prices up. But the... Um, But if you can find a house, you know, if you're out of debt and you have your emergency fund, you have a good down payment, you're going to buy something more conservative than your peers. No question about it. Yeah. But again, it's not, it's it's the long game. That's the definition of winning is not, don't follow your broke friends. Right. It's not how fast you you come out of the gate. It's how you finish. And and got to remember that. It's so enticing. You're not making 500 a year. You're making 140 a year. I mean, it's a lot of money. It's a lot. It's double the household income average, but it's only double. It's not 4x and it's not 6x. So, you know, average house price in your area, plus a little, that's what you're going to be getting. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. Nick and Laura are with us. Hey, guys, how are you? Good. How are you, Dave? Better than I deserve. Where do you guys live? San Bernardino, California. Oh, fun. Welcome to Nashville. And here to do a debt-free scream, how much have you paid off? 223000 I love it. Wow. And how long did that take? 99 months. 99 months. Long Look at time. you. <laughs> and uh, your range of income during that 99 months? We started at 71000 and ended at 195 Very cool. What do you all do for a living? Well, I am a homeschool mom, mm-hmm. and I also do real estate on the side. Mm-hmm. And I work for the county, local government there. Okay. Very good. Well, you guys are doing well. So 99 months, 223 Is this your house? This is everything, Dave. One to seven. Paid off the house. <laughs> everything. Yeah, everything. Looking at weird people. <laughs> yep. I mean, you live in freaking San Bernardino, California and have a paid for house. Yes, we this do. This is a big deal. <laughs> What's this house worth? A little over 600000 I bet it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations. Ding, ding. How much you guys got in your investments for retirement and so forth? Uh, we have about 150 in Roths mm-hmm. and about 200 in a pension. All right. So that puts you at millionaire status, doesn't it? Got to be close. Right there. Baby, baby steps millionaires, <laughs> right on the line anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Really close. If we throw in the furniture, we're there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> There's not Boy. much furniture, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, guys. Congratulations. How old are you? 42. 42. Both 42. Years. 42 and a paid for house. And basically, Baby Steps Millionaires. I'm so proud of y'all. Thank you. Tell us the story. What happened 99 months ago? How'd you get connected with this Ramsey stuff? Well, we, uh, I listened to you when I was younger, um, probably when we were both younger, Dave. Uh, <laughs> and I was doing good, and, and uh, we were moving in the right direction. I worked for a bank, and we went south. We went on the borrowing trend, and uh, we borrowed everything we could. We wood-burning stoves credit cards, everything else you can do. Somewhere along the lines, we just started going negative every month. Every month we were, you know, we were losing money. We were just not saving. We were just going red, 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 red. Mm. Until one day I realized I couldn't pay, couldn't put gas in my car without putting on a credit card. Mm. Felt like a loser. Felt like a pretty bad father because we had just had uh, two beautiful girls. And I kind of remembered everything I listened to on the radio. Mm. Went back and and, uh, restarted. Um, in our mid thirties and then we suffered a lot over the last eight years and Mm -hmm. here we are. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Laura, he walks in and goes, uh, this isn't working. What'd you say? I said, okay, well, how do we fix it? And he said, oh, well, there's this Dave Ramsey guy and he has this plan and we're going to have to cut everything. I'm going to sell my dream truck. And I said, Ooh, hard pass. (laughs) <laughs> I don't think so. That sounds terrible, actually. You know, I had two babies, and I I didn't want to do it. But I, I wanted to support my husband, and so I did it for about nine months without my heart in it. Mm. Uh, but I did it, mm-hmm. you know, to the letter. And then uh, one day, we were sitting at the dining room table, and we paid off our car. And I looked up, and I said, oh, my gosh, th- this could work. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. And, ding, ding. And Light it, comes on. Huh? It, it came on, and I started listening to the show, and, you know, it was game on from there. My yeah. heart was in it, and then it was different, you know, from then on. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you took nine months of you kind of dragging her along, huh? Yeah. And then she yeah. goes, okay, wait a minute. Dad gum. This stuff is, yeah, okay. I there like it. There might be something here. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, I picked up on the word suffering. Which yeah. Yeah. It was a little bit sarcastic, but yeah. Yeah, but I, I think he's actually, there's probably a lot of truth to that. And, and, and I want people to hear. It's not easy. How difficult this was for you guys, but how it feels on the other side. So give us a little window into what suffering, even sarcastically, meant. Well, I always joke that Dave Ramsey ruined my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there's a but, whole there's a whole internet channel on that. <laughs> but the truth is, I mean, you're going to see your friends. They're going to be buying trucks and they're going to be drive, driving side by sides down the road, and mm-hmm. and they're going to be having a lot of fun. And there's going to be a time where you have to suck it up and you have to say, "I'm going to get some," and I'm not going. I'm going to say no. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think for your normal working family, you have to pay a price. Um, if you just if you just wander through. Um, you'll wander right into debt just like every, all the Joneses, and you'll be comparing yourself. So I think there's just a time where you have to have discipline 
and you have to say, hey, this is hard, but it's the best, best thing for my future, for my girls, you know, for, for the rest of my life. And so that's where, where, where your temporary pleasures, I think we, um, we had to put aside for a minute and we had to focus on our goal, mm-hmm. which took a long time, took eight years. Mm-hmm. So what's the dream now? 42 and you guys are debt free, house and everything. Well, how does that change your vision? Well, our first dream was to come to Nashville to <laughs> check it off the box, Pastor. Pastor you're you guys. there. You're there. One down. Yeah. So <laughs> next dream. <laughs> yeah. I watched a lot of debt free screams, and I always thought if we make it, we're going. Yeah. I like it. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I'm so was, proud of y'all. It's a good deal. So, what, what, what is the next big thing? Yeah. For me, you know, the next big thing is to set up my girls for um, a success, you know, in, a, in just a better platform mm-hmm. to build off of than I had. I'm from a single wide trailer, even though it's in California. Um, and I just want better for them. So for me, the, the future is trying to build for them and then us enjoying our lives a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and really being a, an opportunity to give and, and affect people in a better way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, congratulations. I guess, guys. Dave, there's probably a nice truck in the future, though. <laughs> I would hope. I think he's, he's earned it. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a side by side. <laughs> He's a millionaire. Yeah, He's forty-two. Why not? Yeah, I mean, come on, come on, pay cash for it. Get you a toy. Yeah, that's good. That y'all should. You should enjoy some of this, and you should give some of it, and you should use some of it for investing and in, um, building up the future and changing your family tree. And you will. So mm-hmm. very, very well done. Very proud of y'all. What do Thank you tell you. people? The key to getting out of debt is. I think that it's avoiding lifestyle creep. Mm-hmm. That was something that I feel that we did really well over the eight years. Mm-hmm. You know, Nick had a lot of promotions and a lot of pay raises. I had a few commission checks come in and they pretty much went all to the mortgage. And that was hard mm-hmm. when you see other people. It's unrewarding. It's very unrewarding. <laughs> and it, it's, it's hard after a while and you just say, oh, I just want to do X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And we just didn't. We just kept saying no. You know, we want to pay a price to win. And and over the course of the eight years, we spent the first four years in baby steps, one through five. And, you know, three, four, five felt like it took a really long time to get through. We really just kind of crawled through those. And those were, you know, hard, slow years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we paid off 180 in the last four years. Whoa. So it really kind of picked up at the end. Yeah. And that's what Well, your income changed during that time. The income changed. Everything changed. We We were working together. And the snowball really got going. Yeah. It was it was really neat to see that. Way to go, you guys. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. We did a tracking process as well. We kind of bought these hurricane lamps and we put some uh, smooth stones in them. Each stone was $500. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the budget meeting at the end of the yeah. month, we would you know see how much we could put in towards it. And we would bring the girls in and we'd each put a rock in. And sometimes we only put two and yep. sometimes we put 15, yeah, you know, you but yeah. it was, it was something that we brought them in for. And we would talk about, you know, why are we even doing this and what yeah. is dead and why is this important? And so bring them up. Let's introduce them. What are their yeah. names and ages? So, so I got two of them here. Oldest is uh, Sabrina. Mm-hmm. Youngest is Cassidy. Mm-hmm. Great. Hey, we've got the Live and Give box for you, the Baby Steps Millionaires book, which is what you've done. Congratulations. The Total Money Makeover book and a Financial Peace University membership for you to either enjoy or give any of it. The, just our way of saying thanks for you to come and people buy that and give that stuff away all the time. So thank you guys. So you. very proud of you. Nick and Laura, Sabrina and Cassidy, San Bernardino, California, 223000 paid off in 99 months making 71 to 195 baby steps millionaires at 42 count it down let's hear a debt free scream are you ready three two one we're debt free yeah Those little girls have a mom and daddy that changed their lives. Yeah. Well done. That's grown-up stuff there, boys and girls. This is The Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Tommy Lasorda says the only problem with success is that it does not teach you how to deal with failure. Joe is with us. Joe is in uh, Cincinnati. Hi, Joe. How are you? I am fantastic. How can we help? All right. Now, I've got a question. I've been pretty intently saving uh, to buy a new Bronco, even sell my early Bronco. And uh, through my intensity and focus, I've actually saved up enough to pay off my home. And now I'm struggling. Do I continue on with my plan to buy my Bronco or pay off my house? Wow, that's cool. Those Broncos are cool. So what do you make? Uh, about 150 mm. What's the Bronco cost? Uh, 56 Okay. And you can pay off your house I'm for I'm a car guy. You can pay off your house for 56 I'm a car guy, and I've got a couple of other ones. Yes. You have a couple of other cars? Yeah, I've got a, an old classic from my father-in-law and then an early Bronco that I've also had for about 35 years that the value has increased on it also. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Those things are through the roof. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Um Well, it's a simple question that you have to answer for yourself. I don't think anyone else can answer it for you. What do you want more, a new Bronco or a paid-off house? And um, I'm the other side of all of that. Um, let, let me just tell you this, too. It's not it's not a permanent choice. It's which one do you want first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you buy the paid-off Bronco, then your next goal is you're going to pay off the house, and you make good money, and you're going to pay it off fairly quick, right? Yes. Or it's if you pay off year. the house, if you pay off the house, you'll have a house payment, um, and now we can save like crazy and mm -hmm. buy a new Bronco. So, I mean, my guess is is that um, two years from today, you've accomplished both goals. Agreed? Yes. So just which one do you want for the next two years? Because the other one's going to wait 18 months to two years. Yeah, I'm also struggling because I've drove junk for years uh, and, and even a free car to keep it going just so I can do something. I'm struggling spending that much money, thinking of spending that much money on a vehicle now. It's always what I thought I wanted. When it comes down to uh, letting it go for that, I don't know. Uh, You're not getting rid of the other two classics, right? No. Okay, good. I was going to say, I love the old Bronco more than the new one, but this is your money. Yeah, oh, I, I wouldn't make the trade. I'd keep those yeah, two and absolutely. then add the, add the new one to the mix. The new one's a cool car. It's it's a neat car. Um, Are you driving something that you're not proud of right now? Is he's that why he's, you driving, that he's driving one of those classics, aren't you? Uh, no, right now no. I'm driving about a $8,000 car. I upgraded last year from yeah. my freebie junker. Uh, so I upgraded. Uh, in the meantime, to save up for a Bronco, I've just been able to save up sooner than I thought. What's the uh, what's the balance on your house exactly? Uh, Seventy-two thousand. And you have fifty-six in the Bronco account, or what? Uh, just in my general savings, uh, we actually have about uh, I think uh, seventy uh, liquid right now, not counting our emergency fund. What's in the emergency fund? Uh, we keep about twenty. In there, and it's normally low, but I've I'm retired military, so I've got a pension, mm -hmm. pretty good pension that comes in monthly. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the car. I love the Bronco. I think they're cool cars. I don't own one of them, but I think they're a very cool car. I can understand where you're coming from. Having said that, I personally would wait 18 months to buy the new Bronco, and I would pay off my house. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. the point is, you're going to do both within 24 months. And you need to have a game plan to do that. It's just a matter of which one goes first. That's the only choice we're making. We're not making a choice of Bronco versus house. We're making a choice of which one comes first in the 24-month calendar. And that helps, me, that helps me make the decision to do the house. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and then, then you're going to feel a little wiser spending this much on a car than you feel right now. You feel like you're overdoing it a little bit right now because that house is still dangling out there. And if you do the house first and the Bronco second, the Bronco's not going to come with as much guilt. Yeah. And if if that 
older Bronco is pretty slick. I'd get rid of the eight thousand dollar car, sell it, drive the sweet Bronco around. If you want to upgrade, you, you, you've worked hard. I get what he's saying. He's like, I've been driving crap for so long, yeah. and now I kind of want to drive something nice. But I'm with you. That house is going up in value. The Bronco he buys will not. No, 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 it's not. I know the old one did, but you're yeah. not going to keep this one forty five years. That's and it's right. not going to be that's correct a thing. So, and it's not. Uh, 1800 bucks which is what you paid for the other ones <laughs> right, exactly right <laughs> back in the day or whatever crazy? whatever it was yeah, know, I, just, but I would be driving that old Bronco uh, around. if it I were me I, it depends on you don't you don't want to mess it up you don't put miles on it. Yeah, yeah I get it not a daily driver Joe's in Cincinnati hey Joe what's up Oh, that's what, it's wait a minute. That's oh, just, we went back to Joe. I just I sure. screwed up. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Brian is in Los Angeles. Let's try that. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hello, sir. I'm doing great. Thank you for the time to be on here today. I've been a big listener to you guys for a while now. And because you, I got out of debt a couple of years ago. Thanks. But um, my, que- my question today is uh, I'm married. I have two boys. We live in Los Angeles County. And my question is uh, we make a good income here. And, um, however, we're very unsatisfied with the quality of life here, just the school values, the crime, the homelessness, and all in all, just the unchristian society. So we're considering relocating to another state, um, such as either Tennessee or Idaho or a few others. Um, the issue is that um, our my projected income would probably be cut close to being in half. Why? What um, do you do? So I'm a police officer in L.A. County, okay. and with overtime, mm-hmm. uh, I usually bring around 140 to 150 a year, and the same salary in those areas are are, are a good bit less, maybe like 60 percent of that. And yeah, but you can also, you're, any... you're at it, you're comparing overtime to no overtime, also. Yep, it's not half, True. but it is in in your field. It is substantially less. Yeah. But it's also worth just kicking the tires in other states. You know, what would a, an Atlanta metro situation? That's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's the cost of living would be less than L.A. Look at multiple states in a region to kind of see what your opportunities are. How long have you been on the force? Uh, that's another thing. Twelve years. So does I'd that qualify, does that qualify you for moving into like a, a highway patrol role in one of the states? Because those do pay a lot more than the states you're talking mm-hmm. about. I, I would likely be able to go into any type of law enforcement field in, in any other state, but just com- comparing it to California, it just it truly is a significant. Um, Not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. How Not, much research have you done on this? And I'm going to tell you why. I covered this story recently. The Fraternal Order of Police, uh, they are having a hard time recruiting police officers. You understand why. I don't need to get into that. And there's a great opportunity right now for you with 12 years of experience in Los Angeles County. I think you need to do more research and see what your opportunities for uh, transfer would look like and then growth. And Dave makes a very good point. There may even moving be into some a, signing bonuses available. Yeah, and moving into a state police role uh, in another region of the country could be really lucrative. And that for would you. not necessarily be a pay cut then. Yeah, I mean, you move into a bureau of investigation yeah. in one of the states like tennessee B- tbi or something like that um but i you, would get out that's the heart of his question i would get out if i felt the way that you set it up to dave and i i would get out yeah i think you're um moving but i think you've got to do a little bit more work on the career side mm-hmm. so that it isn't as big a cut as you perceive it to be that's correct because that the, what you're outlining at first blush is true I mean, if you compare it to an outlying county or something like that in, uh, you know, in, in a Texas, a Tennessee, or what Florida, whatever, you might, you might, uh, you might see that bigger cut. But there's ways to get into a metro situation. There's ways to get into state situations, mm-hmm. and with your experience, you might move in, move up several. Um, let pay levels uh, in one of those states and actually come out fairly close. And there's overtime available everywhere in your world. Tell you what, high school football games and church yeah. on Sunday everywhere. morning. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. Police everywhere. Yeah. Hey, man, we appreciate you. Stay safe out there. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace. Christ Jesus.
Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today.